Good morning everyone and welcome to our church service this morning online from Bentley Baptist Church. Whether you're a regular here or whether you've just popped in or you can't make it to church this morning, it's really good to have you here with us. So you may not know me or even recognise me without my hat, I'm a jazzy shirt, but I'm Andrew and I'm the secretary at Bentley Baptist Church. So, it was pancake day on Tuesday. Did you get pancakes? I didn't. However, pancake day on Tuesday means Lent on Wednesday. So Lent, a period of uh, reflection and contemplation leading up to Easter. But what a lot of people associate with Lent is giving up something for either the good of yourself or for other people. So if you're giving up something for Lent, why not drop a line into the chat on the uh, YouTube link or even post on our Facebook page and tell us what that means for you in this period. So later on this morning, we're going to worship first and then Joel is going to bring the word today, a healthy hub. Now we've talked over the last year quite a lot about hubs and it'll be really interesting to see what Joel's going to bring us afresh this morning on that subject. Please do hang around after the service for the notices. They sometimes, yeah, get a bit repetitive, but today important news about our AGM, especially for some of you, which occurs later on this month. So let's pray before we go into worship. Lord, we thank you that you bless us by your presence and we seek to honour you in our worship. We pray, especially this morning, Lord, for those in the Ukraine, for all those suffering and afraid, that you will be close to them and protect them. We pray for the world leaders, Lord, for compassion, strength and wisdom to guide their choices in the coming days and weeks. We pray for the world that in this moment of crisis, we may reach out in solidarity to our brothers and sisters in need. May we walk in your ways, Lord, so that peace and justice become a reality for the people of the Ukraine and for the rest of the world. We thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers. Amen. Let's join uh, in worship together. Of sin and darkness Whose love is mine 
If I asked you, what is the vision and purpose for your life, what would you say? Hard question, maybe. What about if I asked you, what is the vision and purpose of the job you do or a charity you serve in or a hobby you have? That might be a little bit easier to answer. But vision is something that churches need as much as any other organisation. Churches need vision. Uh, There's a a passage in the book of Proverbs in the Bible, chapter 29, that says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. The King James Version puts it like this. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Jesus knew that vision was vital. And so he said this, he he gave this uh, what we call the Great Commission to his disciples right before he returned to heaven. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. I am with you always to the end of the age. What a vision. What a phenomenal thing that Jesus was calling them to, to go into all of the world and help people to become disciples. That means to become like Jesus quite a vision. And as we'll explore later, uh, our vision as a church echoes that original vision that Jesus gave to those first disciples. But um, as I've already said, vision, uh, purpose, values, these are really vital things for any organisation to have. And I want to tell you a story Uh, about how they are helpful. There's a company in the US, an airline company called Southwest Airlines. And Southwest Airlines, uh, uh, you know, they they fly people all over the place and they're they're a a very reputable organisation. And and they have these three core values uh, that, that, you know, they they try to hold to and they try and uh, imbue in all of their staff. These three values are a warrior spirit, That sounds cool, doesn't it? A servant heart and a fun loving attitude. Interesting. And as I say, what that final value, a fun loving attitude. That's a really interesting thing for a business organization to encourage. But uh, but but this is something they have. They they imbue it in all of their employees. They look to employ people who are already fun loving individuals. And they say that uh, it's vital in the way they engage with customers and they they do their flights and people have to do their jobs with a fun loving attitude. It is a core value. So one day on a flight, Uh, One of the flight attendants is giving the pre-flight briefing and she's, you know, telling people where life jackets are, telling people not to smoke, to fasten seatbelts. And then she she does the bit of the talk about what to do in the event of a water landing. And she said something like this. In the event of the need for a water landing, your flight attendant will come by with drinks and towels. And then she went on with a funny script, dropping a a few more gags in. Didn't seem to be anything wrong. But a short while after the flight, uh, Herb Keller, the CEO 
of Southwest Airlines received a letter from one of the passengers on that flight. And she said that she was a longtime customer of the airlines and she did not approve of the, the levity, of the, the mockery seemingly of, uh, you know, what, what would happen in a water landing. She, uh, she, she said that in her opinion, the safety of passengers is nothing to joke about. And she said that she felt she would have to find another airline if that was how Southwest continued to handle their safety announcements. What would you do in this situation? A customer, a paying customer, has been offended by something, they found something really challenging, and, uh, and, uh, and yet one of their core values is a sense of humour. What should you do? Maybe just send her some free air miles so that she can fly again with them. You know, maybe she'll forgive them. Maybe uh, he goes back and, and uh, he, he does do a bit of a tweak. He says, maybe just on the safety bit, we tone down the humour there. What do you think he did? Well, Herb Keller did write back to this woman. He wrote her a letter and uh, it was not a long letter. In fact, it was just three words and they said, We'll miss you. Goodbye. They would rather stick true to their principles, to their values, than compromise because they'd upset one person. I wonder if churches always have that same passion for the vision that God has given us. Or do we kowtow? Do we, do we bend to pressure from individuals with loud voices? You see, clarity about where we're going helps us make those difficult decisions. One of the hardest things in church leadership is often deciding what are we going to actually do how are we going to lead this church? Where, where's God calling us to go? And, and many people often come with, with good ideas and they'll tell me or they'll tell someone on our leadership they're good ideas. But here's the thing. I love that people have good ideas. I love that people have their individual passions. And if I ask everyone watching this or everyone in our church building on a Sunday, I'm sure people would come with loads of incredible creative suggestions. But I don't want your good ideas. I want God's idea because it's not an idea. It's not a thought. It's not a maybe. When God speaks, he will make a way for that to come to pass. And so I don't want good ideas. I want God ideas. What is God saying? And are we going to do it? And in recent times, you know, God has, has been leading and speaking to our church. We, we have a vision it echoes Matthew 28. Our vision, our purpose for existing is to make disciples who make disciples. We have three values that are up outside the wall of the church. They're on our website. They say that we love God, we love people and we love life. And actually, we developed a strategy as well, because it's not just good enough to say, yeah, we hope people will become disciples who make disciples. And yeah, we love everyone. Great. I mean, who doesn't? But actually, we have a strategy. We call it our discipleship journey strategy because we recognise that becoming a disciple of Jesus, becoming like Jesus is quite a process, is quite a journey. There are lots of steps in this. And so we try and put uh, different uh, pieces of ministry, different pieces of work in different places to help people with different steps. We have steps that help people first connect with a Christian, like our food bank that, that loves people in practical ways, like our Renew Centre where people can just drop in. And we can also build relationships at our Renew Centre, help people to develop uh, trusted relationships with Christians and, and become credible to them. Uh, we do that in our personal relationships as well, in our life groups. The next step is, is for exploring faith because you've got to be able to ask questions. And as Christians, we've got to listen to where people have come from to understand their journey so far. And so we, we've just had an alpha course, which has been a great way to discuss and wrestle with, with the, the things of the Christian faith, the things of God. At some point, uh, one step is to make a commitment to choose to follow God or to step away. 
And then from that, there are countless further steps as we journey together closer to him as his disciples. Those are the, the steps we talk about in our journey strategy. But what comes after that? You know, where, where are we actually going to, to have those moments where we do first connect with people, where we, we walk with people as they start the journey? Well, this is what I want to talk about today and, and next week, in fact, because uh, when I was um, when I was uh, becoming the minister of the church, when I was going through my induction service, there were two prophetic words. That's messages from God that were given to us. And the first one uh, was from a guy who said that that he had a vision that, that we were telling him that uh, 18 sort of uh, churches or small Christian communities have been planted in the community around uh, Bentley Baptist Church, little outposts. And the second prophetic word was someone who said that he saw uh, the church like the hub of a wheel with spokes going out to spiritual outposts in the community. The expansion was a key word. And then uh, without telling lots of the leaders about these, some of them knew, but most of the, the leaders on this, uh, this away day didn't. We went on this away day, took the leaders away, and we said, what's God saying to you? And they came back with more prophetic words that confirmed this vision that we'd already been given. Uh, we had someone who, who saw lots of small locks on a big gate, small things connected to something central. Many ducks that were all gathered around this tree who fly together, who uh, flock together for safety, for security, for growth, but then also go off and do their own thing. We had uh, a picture of a tree and its roots, a central hub with outposts leading off to the sides. And we had a picture of St. Michael's Mount, this central hub that at times through the day has a single causeway that leads back to land. All pictures of a central hub with spiritual outposts branching off like spokes. And so we think this is, uh, this is gonna be the shape of our church in the coming days a healthy hub with spiritual outposts. And I'm going to talk about the spiritual outposts next week, because this week I just want to lay down some stuff about what it looks like to be a healthy hub. In Ephesians chapter four, a guy called Paul writes this. I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you've been called by God. He's speaking to a whole church here, not individuals. He says this, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there's one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one hope for the future. There is one Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all and living through all. What's the message here? Well, the first thing that we learn about being a healthy hub from this chapter in Ephesians is that we are meant to be united in love for one another under God. Love for God and love for for people, for one another. We're meant to be sacrificial in our love. Now, everyone thinks that's pretty obvious, but it's not always easy. My wife, Kirsty, works in a warehouse and uh, she she's uh, often working on a, a conveyor belt system and, uh, and, and she needs someone to bring her uh, boxes. And this, this person brings over boxes and sometimes, because these guys are lugging stuff around all night, they get a little bit smelly. Now, Kirsty could say to them, you smell bad. Please don't come near me with those boxes. I'm going to gag. But she can't do that because if she does that, she won't receive from them what she needs to do her part of the job. It's the same in church. Sometimes we can be a little bit unlovely to each other. Sometimes there can be people that we don't click with. That we have even experience rudeness and offence from. 
But this passage of scripture in Ephesians 4 says we have to be sacrificial. We have to bear with one another in love. That's the first thing for us to be a healthy hub as a church. We have to bear with one another in love. The second thing, let's let's check this out. It says this, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Did you hear that? The job of pastors and teachers and evangelists is not to do all the work. It's to equip God's people to take part in the work. When I was the youth pastor at uh, my, my previous church, uh, there was a group of 12, 11, 12 year old guys who uh, were pretty wild. And the, the church had small groups for the young people, uh, but no one wanted to run a small group for this group of lads. So new youth pastor, I, uh, I dived in and I took this on. And it was wild. Sometimes we'd go to McDonald's and there'd be all kinds of crazy chip fights. And sometimes there'd be ridiculous questions and no one would focus on, on the Bible we were meant to be looking at. It was carnage. But as we journeyed together over time, they became the most incredible disciples, the most incredible followers of Jesus. God raised up in them gifts of worship, gifts of compassion, gifts of justice, gifts of social action, gifts that God used in their workplaces, gifts of leadership in the church, gifts that God raised up in them of, of like care and concern for the lost, last and least. They have become as adults uh, as men out in the world now, the most incredible group of guys, and I love them, and I'm so honoured that that God let me journey with them for those years. It's such a testimony to, to just how incredible uh, the, the purposes he calls us to are. He is just, he's phenomenal, and and it's the same for us in church. We're called to encourage one another, raise one another up, to seek to live lives of Christian maturity, to learn all that God has for us. So the first thing about being a healthy hub is that we need to bear with one another in love, journeying together, sacrificially loving each other. The second thing is that we have to raise one another up. We have to equip one another for the work that God has for us to do. Here's the third part of Ephesians 4. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body the church. He makes the whole body fit together as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. A healthy hub is focused on the mission, being faithful to his teaching. When I go on a journey with my kids, with my whole family, four kids under 10, we don't just throw them in the car and drive without telling them where we're going. It would be carnage. Instead, we tell our kids where we're going. We give them an idea of how long it's going to take. Roughly, you know, what time of day will we be arriving there? We make sure they have the snacks they need so they're fed, so they're healthy. So they're happy and content. We make sure they have some entertainment. And then I focus on the directions. My wife focuses on the driving. And the kids, if one of them's a bit stressed, maybe we ask one of the others to help their sibling through the journey. When we all know our role in the journey, it's much easier to go there together. And that's the third thing 
when we're focused on the mission ahead of us, faithful to God's teaching, working together, we have a healthy hub. Loving one another sacrificially, building one another up to spiritual maturity and united with our focus on the destination. Those three things will help us be a healthy hub. Because if we're not a healthy hub, any spiritual outpost we plant isn't going to be very healthy either. And we're, we're going to get into what those outposts will be next week. But for this week, here's a challenge. Because we can't be a healthy hub just because I want us to be. Being a healthy hub is that a choice all of us have to make together. It's a choice to, to practice sacrificial love when your Christian brothers and sisters are rude or annoying. Being a healthy hub is a choice for each of us to be united in the Holy Spirit with people who aren't like us. Being a healthy hub is a choice to forgive and to receive forgiveness. Being a healthy hub is a choice to be guided by God, even if he's asking us to do something uncomfortable. Being a healthy hub is a choice to be a teachable person, to not assume we know it all, to make mature choices and to grow in knowledge through studying God's word. Being, being a healthy hub, do you know, it's really simple. It's just a choice to put God's mission first. When, when it all comes down to it, it's just a way of living together where we seek every opportunity to build one another up. Who wouldn't want to be a part of a community that just encourages and cares for and builds one another up? That's it. That's what a healthy hub is to look like. Jesus himself said, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And in Psalm 133, it says these words, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Wouldn't you want to be part of that kind of community? I know I do. So this week, may God bless you. May God convict you. May God help you to grow a desire to contribute for our church to be the healthy hub it needs to be. May you know that he loves you and that that love can only be made more complete as part of the healthy hub that is the body of Christ. God bless you, the Lord be with you, and I'll see you soon. Well, hello again. Thanks, Joel, for the word this morning. Lots to think about, lots to pray and discern from what you've spoken about this morning. Now, our AGM is on the 22nd of March, and I really need to speak to you about postal voting. This is something new for church. Um, we can only use postal voting at an AGM where we're voting for uh, people to take on roles and as I've tried to explain in the past few weeks this year because we're a CIO first time we've had an AGM as a CIO everybody is up for election so the new constitution tries not to exclude people from being involved in postal voting so just bear with me while I go through a PowerPoint, which uh, should be on the screen as well. So we're looking at postal voting for the age year. So the first question is, can you have a postal vote? Well, maybe you can or maybe you can't. So I'm going to try and explain who that applies to now. So where do we go to to get our guidance on this? So we go to our constitution, 
and we go to the church guidance document which everybody voted on um, back in 2021 or maybe even 2020 time has flown over the past couple of years so you may be entitled to a postal vote if you can't come to the meeting due to an unavoidable absence so what is an unavoidable absence so it means if you're unable to come and you've got a short term ill health issue and you have a certificate of sickness then you can ask for a postal vote if you've got a long-term ill health or disability or you're a carer for somebody who has um, a long-term ill health or disability issue you can both apply for a postal vote if you're person with childcare responsibilities so a single parent or in the case of couples one of the two of you needs to be at home for childcare you can apply for a postal vote if you're a shift worker who is at work you can apply for a postal vote and finally if you've got work commitments which require you being away from Doncaster at the time of the meeting, you can also apply for a postal vote. So any of those categories, of course, the overriding caveat is that you're a church member um, because whilst we welcome all of you to come to our AGM and our church members meeting which follows it only members can vote in this current situation so if you want a postal vote you have to speak to one of the charity trustees and it will be considered based on your individual circumstances as to whether they meet the criteria or not what that really means is you come and speak to me today or Joel next week after the service if you think you qualify and that you want a postal vote for the AGM. We will tell you exactly what you have to do at that time and the biggest thing of all is postal votes must be back with me by midday on the Sunday before the church meeting so that means postal votes have got to be in the office or with me personally by Sunday the 20th of March so thank you for listening don't be put off by all of this if you think it applies to you or you want more information as I said, come and speak to me after the service or Joel after the service next week. Our AGM is an important part of the year and even more so this year because of all the voting that's going on. So please do um, consider having a postal vote if it applies to you. So nearly at the end, folks. All I would just like to say is uh, thank you for everybody who's put this service together this morning. If you want to know more, you can pick up on our bulletin. If you don't already get a bulletin, you can drop us an email and Hannah will put you on the mailing list for our weekly bulletin. There you can see all the information about what's going on in church. You can catch up with us on our website, on Facebook, and on Instagram so we look forward to um, meeting with you over this coming week in some form or other thank you for being here this morning and God bless you during the coming week Amen bye